Okay, well, welcome. I'll use my teacher voice. Um, my name is Joel Truesdell. I finished uh, last, maybe September, my 30th year of teaching. 17 years on our little sister campus at Kapalama. <laughs> and then now it's finished uh, the 14th year over uh, in Hilo. Okay, I'll. Now, um, kind of the, the title that we came up with, and I've, I've taken a lot of the chemistry out. I'm sure that a lot of you were not really excited about being tested on that at the end. <laughs> so uh, it's going to focus on the journey, and it's going to focus on a lot of techniques that I use that work extremely well in STEM, but as you're going to see, they work in other areas too. It's basic uh, when it comes down to it comes down to basic things for what would be a world-class Hawaiian culture-based uh, uh, curriculum. Okay. Now, my journey started when I was a little kid. This is over 50 years ago. When I was in first grade, I had Mrs. Dorothy Krause as a teacher. Loved her. She was recognized as the best teacher in the entire district. She'd been actually teaching at uh, the Tuscarora Indian School. But when the New York State Power Authority condemned her property, and uh, she kind of protested a little bit, so they moved her off the reservation to Sanborn Elementary School, where I had her for first grade. Then they moved her a little further away to Eric Road Elementary, where I had her for fifth grade. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you, it's kind of uh, it's along the same theme as to what she did. So there was no term culture-based educator back then, but she did, she taught the way that her elders had taught her. Okay? Now, um, oh, one other thing. I almost forgot this. In fifth grade, um, I was the best student in the class. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was the best student. Uh, second, third, and fourth, not so much. So she recommended me for honors. Honors sixth grade at Edward Town Junior High School. I went in there, and the teacher taught in there in a very, very standard lecture, memorize this way. Out of 24 people, I was number 24. I was never in another honors class after that. It's because it was the wrong system for the way that I learned best, okay? And I've always thought about that, but it always took me a, long, a while to kind of like connect the dots as to how to teach my kids. Okay? So what she did was we, she would take the Tuscarora culture, she'd put a little bit out, and we would sit and we could do artwork with it. We could do math. We could do science. We could do um, all sorts of different types of things. We could write about it. But essentially, she connected everything to the Tuscarora culture. So if the kids, even if the kids were not part Native American, they were, they were familiar with the culture because it was like right over there. It was part of the, it was part of the community, okay? And what we're gonna find is that this could be ex uh, extended to any culture, the way she taught, okay? Yeah, I already said that one. So anyway, oop, did I go the wrong way? Yeah. Here's her picture. She's the one with the gray hair <laughs> up here. And it's the only picture that I could find of her. She basically, to the Tuscarora Nation, is there, or are, Mary Kavenik Pukui. She's a co-author of the Tuscarora English Dictionary. So, but she was still the best educator that I ever had the experience of having as a teacher. So. We did do a lot of inquiry. We would do projects. It was all about taking things into the world of the kids, okay? And she was, she was a hard grader. Now, Papa Henry Owai, when I started over at Kapala pretty early, I saw uh, an article in the paper in the Star Bulletin about Papa Owai presenting at the Smithsonian Festival of Folk Arts in Washington, D.C and how he basically what he not only was was healing people but also he talked about how he had been kicked out of Kamehameha in 1921 for speaking Hawaiian 
That's the way it was back then. So I wrote him a letter and said, would you be willing to come talk to my kids? Because I realized that what he was doing, it was cultural, it related to chemistry. Um, and when I talked to him on the phone, I thought, this is a perfect person to bring back to share the ancient wisdom with our kids. And he came over there, oop, and he brought his young assistant, Auntie Sabina Mahilona. She was only 75. <laughs> He came over there and we treated them with the proper respect and he truly appreciated that. You know, we waited on him hand and foot. We treated him like we would treat our own elders or our own, you know, uh, our grandparents. And so, uh, and the kids loved him. They absolutely loved him. And so, um, oh, back. On. But I started asking him. So I had a relationship from you know, about 1989 all the way until he passed a little over a decade later. And I asked him, and this would always come up in conversation, was really on how he was taught. And he would say, you know, that he would give kind of a, a more of a generic answer. But what it came down to was, and I saw this with the students in my Summer Science Institute, you had to prepare. You had to come in with a foundation of knowledge. And I remember this one young man, I won't name him, I'm not that's sure, he might be, um, related to the organization here, who came in and said, Papa, can you tell me all about this? No, that meant he really hadn't done any investigation. The questions needed to be um, a little bit more sophisticated than that, very pointed, not just tell me everything you know. That, at that point, your foundational knowledge, you're applying it to zero. So he kind of got scolded. So which case, so he talked about how Everything was that you really had to continue to establish a foundation, and then the questions you asked were on those things where you ran into roadblocks. But the mind was going, and the mind was active. Okay? So he came, we, uh, I put together and brought him over for three days. He stayed up in Keopuolani with uh, uh, Auntie Sabina, one day with an advanced Hawaiian language, one day with Hawaiian culture students, and one day with, uh, with my chemistry kids and the honor science research kids. And so every year after that, when he was healthy, my summer science institute that I started the next year, I had the kids investigate Hawaiian medicinal plants and marine organisms. I'd have 18 students in the summer for six weeks. And what they would have to do is they would have to write a paper, give a presentation, and conduct research to where they got to at least having tested it against uh, bacteria and cancer cells. It was the beginning of a culture-based super science fair project. And we had incredible results down here. Now, one of the big turning points that, that really kind of like, these things come into my mind, but then I just kind of like, you get busy and you kind of forget about it. I had this young lady in there who applied and she had a 2.8 GPA, the lowest of any of the applicants. But I also had the kids write an essay. Tell me why they wanted to be in there. She was so passionate. I thought, oh, this girl, I mean, they, this is something that she really wants. I'll let her, let her in, even though there was another person who had a higher GPA whose spot she took. Well, she comes in, and she was just fabulous in the lab. Papa, oh, I loved her, loved her. You know, they would talk on the phone frequently about her project, and so, it got to the spring, and I got a call from Mike Berger, the mass spectroscopist at UH Manoa. He calls me up, and he's one of the judges at the State Science Fair. He goes, I got this girl here, and she's, she's incredible. Then I get a call from, uh, this is the day of the science fair, from uh, Art Kimura, a professor at Chaminade University. So this girl with a 2.8 GPA got a scholarship to Chaminade in science. So in which case, what that told me there was that there are lots of kids getting these two point whatever GPAs who can be A students. It's just more a matter of us figuring out how to alter our curriculum to have them as engaged as that girl was. Everybody has uh, things keeping them from doing that if they're not a top student. So I kind of tucked that away. And we had incredible success with the kids coming out of there. Um, 
went back, and Lane Richards used to keep track of this. We had, by the time we moved to the Big Island in 2004, uh, that the one million dollar level was not, that was not an, even including a lot of the scholarships. That was a lot of the other stuff. And 19 kids went to the International Science Fair and placed in the top four. Okay? So there was a lot to say for starting with the culture and then moving on through the concept. And all I was doing was what Mrs. Krause had done. 2012, um, I'm at a standards-based Kula Hawaii meeting, the inaugural one up at Midkiff Learning Center, and I'm talking to Jacob Lono, who had been a fellow chemistry teacher when we were over here. And all of a sudden, it just clicked in my mind. What I was doing was I was enhancing the Hawaiian identity when I would do the concept in my regular chemistry classes and then say, oh, but wait a minute. At the, after we've done this, oh, this is how it connects to the Hawaiian culture. It wasn't driving the learning. So at that point, I went back, and this also was at the exact same time that we had Lehua Vincent come in as our principal and Hola Uestender come in as our headmaster. So those guys, basically, I went back with my idea, and they all said, that sounds great. Go for it. So I ordered uh, core seedlings, okay? And that was what I was starting with. I was going to teach the kids some relevance relative to the plants and things that I could already see some of the chemistry connections. Okay, so this was the actual thing that the kids did when they came in that August. So day one, I still give them this, okay? I tell them, your homework assignment tonight is you're going to go home and you're going to find out the growing conditions and, and when you come back next week, they have to talk to an elder. They have to, okay? Because how are you going to pass along ancient <coughs> wisdom if you don't go and seek it out. A lot of the elders, there may be a little uh, a gap there between grandparents and child, you know, parents in the way. It may not get passed along. People may be too busy. A lot of times kids are not that interested. Well, we're putting, we're going to increase the interest in that here to get them talking to their elders. And they had to come up with the growing conditions. They came in, second day, we discussed it all, came up with the, the best growing conditions, okay? Then, oh, but what it does also is, by doing that the first day, it establishes what is the importance of Hawaiian culture in this curriculum. It's up here. Everything else is subordinate. So, two weeks after they came into my class, we have core seedlings. Now we actually have Ohia and Iliahi seedlings too. And so, when we get them is sometimes dependent upon when they're available, since they're kind of high in demand but they have to pot them because they're going to raise these for four months, measuring the heights, taking care of them, okay? Because actually, and they have to give them a Hawaiian name, okay? They're caring for them. They're learning to actually care for and raise the plants. Sustainability and the growth of uh, Hawaiian plants is a skill that they're going to come out of my class with, okay? The, uh, when they actually do the, uh, Measuring of the heights. In the next generation science standards, it satisfies the standard of doing a long-term data collection. So we're not just doing this for the fun of it. It's actually, they will write a lab report. I won't even have to give them how to write it. They know what they did, and they know what they measured, and they know what the outcomes are, okay? Now, planting time, we celebrate by going out into the forest. We have eight acres now, and the kids have to show up, and we've already gone over all of the techniques for planting. Uh, we go over, um, they understand fertilizers and ions and solubility and pH, you know, through this project. What we did, though, is we've actually found out a lot of things. We, we understand now that the land that we're on used to be an Ohia forest, where, and it was the, it's Ola'a, which was known for the highest concentration of colored <laughs> endemic birds, where the feathers would come from for capes and other part cultural things that they would use, was wiped out for sugarcane way back in the day. They brought the sugarcane in. The sugarcane depleted the soil of potassium and put a layer, of, a layer of dirt on the top. To grow endemic plants, every endemic plant requires great drainage. The plants evolved 
on volcanic soil. So we have to, the kids understand that we're going to have to adapt the soil, test it, and make sure that you have the best growing conditions possible. Okay. Um, we did, we have one other thing that we came up with through ancient wisdom. Um, talking to an elder, Thomas Hughes, I don't know, if, like class of 53, I was talking to him about this. We, our second crop that we put in, pigs wiped out 400 trees like one weekend. They dig. The, the bacteria in the uh, soil, down in the, in the root ball, smells like rotting food to the pig. So they just dig it out, knock it over, dig it out, knock it over. We now put human hair around the top of it. They haven't touched a, uh, a, a plant since we did that, since we started that. Except for a couple where the kids forgot to put the hair on. <laughs> okay, now I wanted to show you this, that a lot of the different things that I'm showing you, and I have a whole long list of activities and labs, but I'm not gonna put that up. A hollow kupu kupu, uh, every year I seem to get a, more and more of these classes of kids from that they're studying. Uh, this was the kids, this, this was the kindergartners. Now this is this was first grade. You know, uh, Hala Kupu Kupu is our summer innovations academy. So they studied koa. I gave them 80 of them to raise over the course of the summer. And so then we have planting day. This was a week ago today. And so they came out, I dig the holes for them, but this group, um, they took, they, they love being out there doing this type of stuff. They got done and they didn't want to leave. And so I just wanted to show you that if the first graders can do it, anybody can do it, okay? The connections are there. Now, the next part. You may recognize this, uh, this young man here. Dr. Walter Kahomoku. Part of my journey was, you know, I was doing this stuff and I was, I was enjoying it and everything, but he came over and asked me to go work in, uh, I, I guess a, a year long set of, uh, I'm not even sure what it was called, like workshops over on the Windward side where we're working with, there were 64 teachers in there who were learning Hawaiian culture based education and trying to implement it, okay, in their classrooms. And so I said, okay, I'll come over and we talked about what I would do. I, I brought over all the equipment so that they could produce the lining of a poho pa'akai, salt drying pond. Uh, basically, the wells in lava, okay, you would line that with heated coral that you would add water to, and it would produce a lining. You put, and it would kind of like a soft Hawaiian cement. You put in salt water, let the sun dry it. More salt water, let the sun dry it. Then all you're doing is just carrying salt up the hill or to your house, and you're not carrying a lot of salt water. So in which case, I brought over all the equipment, and I had like 64 people that uh, I did in, in four groups, working with them. And I talked to them all about a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff, and really how kids learn best. Now, Walter's a sly guy. I, he made me think that it was, I was just teaching science teachers. But it was K through 12, all disciplined. So I thought, oh, it challenged me. But the bottom line is that all that really pointed out to me is the techniques, it doesn't matter if it's science. A lot of them are gonna translate over into all of the different disciplines and all the different grade levels. So he had a hoike at Windward Community College in April. And so I got to go see the teachers and they would present for 15 minutes. And I got to see an awful lot of teachers, some of them fresh off the plane, doing great Hawaiian culture-based uh, uh, teaching. They'd show videos and, and show materials. And that also told me that um, it further, it, it not, I already knew that I could do it or people could do it if they're not Hawaiian, okay? Because I'm not Hawaiian. But it showed me that people who really were coming in with even very little knowledge of the culture could learn it and do it. So they really, that, that removed a barrier in my own mind. He also gave me the data later that uh, 43% of the people that I taught actually use this stuff in their class. So it wasn't just science. So that kind of opened my eyes a little bit. But what it also told me was, I need to continue to grow and find other things because I wasn't done yet, okay? So I still had kids that weren't, they were, they were better than they were in science, but I thought I still wasn't 
tapping the potential like, uh, like that girl that uh, had had in Summer Science Institute. Okay. So I want you to just think about it, just for a minute. Why are students not successful? And this is something you're probably not going to get in a minute, but it's something you can do when you, when you leave and, and go ahead and fill that in. Talk to kids, talk to other people, talk to educators. Why are kids not successful? Because this is what I started to ask myself right around this time. How come I still have some kids that get C's? How come I have some kids that still, you know, are down there hovering between the C and the D range? Um, there's got to be something there, okay, as to why they're not, okay? But the next part is, after you list all of those, what things can you impact? If there are real severe problems at home, some other different problems, you know, that, that really are out of your control, you can only, those ones, you can't focus on, you know, you can, you can do your best to talk to the family and things like that, but you may not change some of those factors. They just may be untouchable. We had one student uh, who was living out of a car, basically had been deserted by his parents. Well, the school, we got him into that, but it was still, there was still a barrier there, you know, the feeling of, of being abandoned. So, but what I do is, my whole goal is always, is to create an environment in the class that is safe and is going to positively impact it by showing them that they, they can be brilliant, okay? And then they, that eventually what's gonna happen in there is the kid is going to come in there and they kind of like start to be able to just kind of leave all of the garbage outside for, you know, for that hour and a half. Okay, so that what we can impact up here, they don't connect with the materials or the examples, will they disengage? Will they be as interested in it? Probably not. Uh, if they have difficulty with the vocabulary, do you lose them? Yeah, you do. You do. I had a student this year, I always have kids that read below grade level, and a lot of the materials are not written, they're not written for the lower kids' grade level in terms of their vocabulary or sentence structure, okay? But if at any point they start to feel like, I don't know what's going on, you can lose them, disengage, okay? Um, if the student comes through with a self-perception that, man, I suck in science, or I suck in math, are they gonna be, are they gonna be tenacious? Are they gonna fight through it? No, they're gonna be accepting that they're not really that good, even though we can see that they are. If it's not hands-on, our kids respond to hands-on stuff. You can make anything hands-on, okay? You can make anything minds-on, hands-on, and I'm gonna show you the way, the way that I do it. But if it's not hands-on and you go too long, they disengage just because they're teenagers. Well, even adults do. Now, passive versus active. This is one of the big parts relative to um, a teacher who comes in and just starts lecturing and you really don't have any foundation in your head, that's, active or that's passive learning. What you're doing is you're trying to take it all in, understand what was said in a very short period of time, process it all, and remember it because you may need it over here a little bit later on. Passive learning is the absolute worst way to do it. Even if you're taking notes, it's still passive learning. Our ancestors never learned that way. Remember what Papa Y said. You know, you gotta go and investigate a little bit and then we're gonna basically come up with the questions. We're, we're building and we're building and we're building, okay? So, with the Hawaiian culture that I start with, there's a foundation. There's a foundation. Even if they haven't, a lot of the kids didn't know about the salt drying ponds, but as I start to talk about it, there's a, there's a foundation there. They know about the lava wells, you know, down by, down by the ocean. They, they know that the salt was gathered in a certain way, so there is a foundation there that I'm building upon, and it's also, it is a, it's an entirely, it's, it's part of them, so that keeps their attention. Now here's the other part. When it comes down, lack of organization of information. The student that, you, that, I, that I would have who'd come in, they take some notes, stuff it into their backpack, and it just looks like a rat's nest in there. <laughs> They learn it, 
they're still going to have to continue to use that for foundation of other things. And we're still, our goal at the end is to have them to be able to do a Western assessment that shows they're going to be successful post-secondary. So I have a way to do that that is interesting to them. Okay, so taking it in, it is introduced and pre-assessed while using culture. Um, it crap all the background stuff with the student culture incorporated. I put their names in there. Okay? You put, and you're going to see an example of this. Put them into the problems and into the little stories. I love to put little stories that are funny, that are entertainment, entertaining, and they can sit and relate to it. You get them laughing, they're engaged. Okay? Now, and I make sure that this is not a barrier. I will take a lot of my materials that I used to have, uh, even if. Um, if I had questions that come out of a, quest, a test bank, I rearrange them to remove the barriers. Let me give you an example. And, and you see this all the time. The people who are writing these materials, resource materials, some of them are not writing it for our kids. All of them are not writing it for kids, period. The bottom line is they're writing it for, um, for a level that they think, I don't know, they, they think more of an honors type of level. But for our kids, they just get really frustrated trying to read it. OK, so let me try to think up an example. Joel, while Elizabeth was, was away at the AP conference, um, ate a lot of junk food. OK? How are the kids reading this real fast? What are they going to say? Who's eating the junk food? Elizabeth. They're not reading it carefully. You put a subordinate clause in the middle of a sentence, which they frequently do. The kids don't see it as a subordinate clause. They're just reading words. And if they misinterpret it, or if it doesn't make, really doesn't make sense and they get lost, now they're disengaged. But stuff like that, um, I take it and I want to put it in a simple form with simple vocabulary, have them get the concept, understand the concept. Now, once they know the concept, you can up the vocabulary and sentence structure a little bit because they already know now what the target is. They know what the concept is. But if somebody is reading at a lower grade level, that's, you've got to get that out there to really see. I want to be testing the students on the science and on the culture. I don't want them getting a chemistry question wrong when they know the chemistry. Okay? I hope that makes sense. Now, I've got to be a cheerleader and build confidence. If I have a student who thinks I'm a D student in science, I'm a D student in science, if I can get them to really be, if I craft my curriculum to the point of where now they get a B, I want to pat them on the back and let them know, you're not a D student, you're a B student now. Now we're going to get you up to an A. I had kids, I had two girls this year who got A's, who failed biology last year. So, but I was a cheerleader the whole way one of them is taking AP chemistry next year, or this fall. The other one thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but well, what she said was, she said, I may, she may take it her senior year, because her best friend was taking it this year, and the best friend kept saying, well, it's so much work, it's so much work. But at least I got her to the point where she's now in the game, and that if she has to take it in college, she's no longer going to avoid it, because she doesn't think of herself as a a D or F student. Okay. Okay. This is all about understanding. I love Farsight. Okay. Okay. So, what do we say to the kids? Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, stay out of the garbage or else. If the kids don't understand the terminology, the concept of uh, the or the sentence structure that's blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 ginger. <laughs> or blah, 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 Mr. Truesdale, blah, 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 Mr. Truesdale. That's it. Let's get it to, I tell them, I show this, I said, I want you up here. So I tell the kids on day one, on day one what I tell them is, if you don't understand the structure of this thing, ask, and I will applaud you. Most all of the work they do in pairs Okay? In pairs, they may be able to explain it to each other, you know, and pick it apart. But sometimes, they just raise their hand, we don't get this. I will take, I will take a look at it, and I will just redo the sentence. I'll redo it in kid language. Okay? 
because I've been doing this stuff now for two years on my materials, but I still miss some. Then I can do is I go back to my computer and I just make it a little bit simpler. Remove the barrier, okay? And so if I say it, I'll, I'll go back and I'll explain it to them in kid language and they'll say, well, why didn't you say that? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, that's something that I just, I just continue to do and I want to get my curriculum to the point of where, oh, but the other thing that I had to do is, I have to tell the kids at the beginning of the year, I will applaud you. And when the kids raise their hand and ask me to come over to explain it, uh, I'll say, great, you're taking command of your, of your education here by doing this. Because if you don't do that type of stuff, the kids will just suffer in silence. Some of them will. And I tell them, I want you, when you go off to college, you don't understand something, you go ask. You go ask. Your grades will, will improve drastically. Okay, now, around this time, um, in 2013, I was a finalist for the Shell Award. So I went to the awards banquet there. This is in San Antonio. And I'm sitting at a table. And when I've been to conferences before, what most people do is they go to things that they're interested in. Well, what they're interested in, they probably already know. The problem is with professional development out here, it's not what we're interested. We don't know what we don't know. So there's all this stuff about engagement. And I wasn't, <clears throat> I didn't even know that I, that these things existed. So I'm sitting next to, at the, at the awards banquet, the person sitting next to me at the table is this woman, Paige Keeley. <coughs> she's, she's a heavy hitter like you wouldn't believe, you know, in science. Had been the president of the organization. She's got 20 books out on formative assessments, pre-assessments, formative assessments, uh, strategies for doing these things in both science and in math. You know, and if you look, Google her, you're gonna see a whole lot of stuff. Well, what she did was, uh, we talked at that, at that meeting. She couldn't believe I didn't know who she was sitting there. <laughs> she really couldn't believe. I said, I don't know. I said, have you been to Hilo? She said, yes. <laughs> she said no. So what I did was, uh, I came back and put together a proposal to bring her out for professional development. And she taught us all about pre-assessing Formative, assess, form, formative assess, assessing and uh, uh, summative assessing. And so, because she said that if we're just teaching and we don't do the ongoing type of assessing and figuring out exactly what the student knows and doesn't know, you get to the end, it's really kind of a mystery as to what you're going to get. And so, she came out and she showed us some techniques and I immediately put them in Hawaiian culture and put them, made them funny. And so, and I did it in a, the teachers where you're doing a little workshop with her and I put all of the other teachers' names in this, you know, and they got kind of offended a little bit. <laughs> but, but essentially what it did was I showed her how to take what she taught and put it into the world of the kids, okay? And my kids, and I'm gonna show you in a little while what that looks like. But what she did was the last two, the last two national meetings, um, and she usually gives three or four different workshops or, uh, or presentations. She invited me, so she presents these different pre-assessment, which she calls probes, and she talks about it for half an hour, and I show the people how to customize it to their kids. And it's been a lot of fun. So, um, so anyway, but the bottom line is she has a lot of great engagement techniques. Okay, I only use a few of them because I use the, actually, it would take more time to go back and do all of the other ones. And the ones that I've picked out and customized, they work. Okay, so at the beginning of this, and I start with a familiar phenomena. At the beginning of a unit, there's something out there in science and in culture that's going on, and there's chemistry in it, but the kids don't know, they don't know that. So this, it's an explanation. So I give it at the beginning, and I give it at the end. And if 60% of the kids get the right answer or an explanation to this question, it tells me which 60 know it and which, what 40% don't. Now, I never give the answer to the student. It's because I want them to discover it. So they're working their way through and they're doing some activity and they go, 
oh, now I know what was going on back there. It's more of an aha moment. If they discover it and figure it out, then if I just tell them the answer. But they're always bugging me for the answer. Okay? Now, what the, the phenomena is given and explanations are proposed. It's also a way of finding science is really big on misconceptions. Okay? We see that on a lot of the different uh, uh, college or um, national, national type of uh, tests. And if they have a misconception, what that also means is they don't really understand the concept. So I put some of the common misconceptions in there. Uh, I do make it fun. The vocabulary barriers are gone, and I definitely make it personal. Okay. So I want to show you this. What this is, I'm showing you some parts of the thermodynamics unit. And again, I won't test you on this at the end. So what I'm doing in this class, my period one, um, I just handed it out. It had actually two of those um, familiar phenomena. So the kids have to read it. They have to pick which explanation is proper, that, you know, which of the five students has the right uh, explanation, and then they have to explain why. So it goes to argumentation. Okay. Okay, hey, page Keeley's. Go ahead and begin. <laughs> you like the avatar? They're all looking for their names. question is, are they engaged? Now what do you think? Are they still engaged? It goes on for another five minutes. OK. Now this is what they were looking at when they said Spencer. Okay. And they, they're fully engaged, and what they do is, you know, as they get done, I just pick it up, and I don't go over it. So, little Spencer's emu. Um, he puts pork shoulder and uala into the emu, cooks it all overnight. Uh, friends come to have some. Once they've uh, opened up the emu, the kalua pork is cool, but the uala is still scalding hot. How come? So that's the question. Remember, it's thermodynamics. So which case then, oop, sorry to take your job. The kids pose, the other kids besides Spencer's pose some different possible answers or explanations. And so they have to go through and they have to figure it out. Uh, and there's humor in there. Nev is always hungry. Nev brings in bags of Oreos. She's, she's, she's an athlete and needs a lot of fuel, but the one, the ones who always like to eat are always going to end up in the just hungry one, and that makes them laugh. But essentially, they go through this thing, 
and I put them in there, and some of the answers look like they might be right because it's it's a misconception, but all of and all of them are sort of okay, but they have to pick the right one, and go ahead and and give an explanation, and it's actually this one. It's called specific heat, how much heat it takes for one gram to go up by one degree Celsius. Certain things, water, and if it's water based, water takes an awful lot more heat to go up than say something like plastic or something like even, even a rock. So in which case, there's some of the rocks. <clears throat> so essentially it's just getting them into that because that's what they're going to be exploring for the whole next uh, 70 minutes. Okay, go ahead. Now what I do it a lot of times is um, when I go do workshops, I'll give them templates. Okay? These are the things that you need to know. Okay? If you have a common phenomena or you've got a topic, you put it there and then start looking. What are some misconceptions? If you don't know them, if you're either a young teacher who hasn't had enough experience or if you're like me and get really forgetful, you just go ahead and Google them and the misconceptions for the topic and you incorporate that into, your, uh, into, your, into this familiar phenomena. Make it clever, put the kids' names in there. But what I always have to do is I ask them on day one, first time we do this, okay, would any of you be offended if I put your name into this? Okay? And I've only ever had one person, Rachel Tanaka. <laughs> she goes, Mr. Truesdell, I, I don't want my name in it. So I said, okay. So two or three weeks later, you know, Mr. Truesdell, how come you never put my name into any of these videos? <laughs> So anyway, so the next, the next class, what I had was I had, I had problems. We'd, we'd gotten done, we were doing some problems. So I had like five or six gas law problems. Whose name was on all of them? <laughs> Rachel Tanaka. <laughs> Mr. Tuesday, why are you picking on me? <laughs> the teenagers, okay? So go ahead. Okay, so this actually just kind of cleans it up a little bit. And this is the one that I actually hand out. The previous one talks about the things. And so uh, when, when we do the workshops or, or give talks, everyone, a lot of the people, especially if it's really a culture-based one, they take it home and just kind of like put it on the, on the wall in front of their desk and use that to, uh, to guide their, their construction of them. Okay. Now, the second thing is, we did that. Okay, that's fine. But what I want to do is I want to tap into prior knowledge cultural knowledge, and I want them to do something hands-on. So this is also from Paige Keeley, predict, explain, observe, it's called a PEO. It's engaging their mind and getting them hands-on. So for this particular one in thermodynamics, what I had them to do, I had them do is, um, they work in pairs, everything from now on is in pairs, and they have to explain things to each other. It has to be talking. Okay. If they can explain it to the other person, they know it well enough. Their understanding is going to come out. In a lot of Western classrooms, they want you going around and asking the things. Okay, can you tell me about this? Explain this to me. Explain this to me. Explain this to me. I don't like to do that. I want them talking to each other, and I just observe. And if they have a problem, then they'll ask me. I don't want to interrupt the flow of the two students, or three students if you have an odd number, just talking about it. Okay, but um, so they have to make a prediction as to what's going to happen. If they do that, then they can go over to the lab benches and do the work. Okay, before I, I get this one going though, I do have to give a little safety briefing. You know, it's kids are kids. You got to make sure they have their glasses on and everything else. Oh, the other thing that I do is, this is critically important. I don't let them touch any electronics until after they've done all of the exploration and they've got the concept. If we're going into a lab, they can then use it. They've already got the concept and understand it. Because kids are smart, they can Google the answers. Even, even if they basically just kind of like, well, what is this? And somebody's gonna have, have, have an answer to it or enough information that it's not coming from their thinking. So I tell them, I don't want anybody to be doing thinking in here that's plugged into the wall, okay? It's gotta be you. Okay, so this is what they did. In the salt drying pond uh, lab, we learned all about the various components of the Hawaiian salt, sea salt, 
Okay? They learned about the components. They actually um, they learned how to do the lining. They've learned the components. So I took some of the different components. Took a little bit of sodium chloride, put it in a baggie, uh, and they've got, uh, <coughs> uh, they mixed 20 milliliters of water. And the question is, thermodynamics, did the heat go up or temperature go up or did the temperature go down? And they have to measure it and observe it, okay? The target down here is that the heat is equal to the mass of the water heated, specific heat of the water heated, and the change in temperature of the water heated. It's not important for you to know this, but it's just that's the concept, okay? Everything has its own amount of heat that it needs to be able to go up or down by a degree, okay? Okay. So they record the data. They do the sodium chloride. They also do sodium bicarbonate. They do calcium chloride. Then what they have to do is, um, and they've predict whether it's endo or exo thermic. Endo, I think in the, in the actual handout, it says endothermic. It gets colder. It has, heat has to enter the, the, the bag. Exothermic, heat is exiting. So I'm giving them the definition, but they have to predict it. Okay, so they record the data. They record all the data. Now, so what have they done? They've already, they've experienced it and they've gathered some data. They're starting to get an understanding about the relationship between uh, heat generated and how, how much uh, mass. Because what they did in this, that I don't have up here, is you got 20, 20 grams of water, five grams of the substance. 20 grams of water, five grams of the substance. When I take these guys, I don't necessarily get the exact same number of degrees that it goes up or goes down. So there's something that is changing in there, okay? Now, these students are actually doing it. You will notice that we have proper goggles and safety equipment here. I'm kind of like a safety monster if the kids take them off. I tell them that the lab is not as important as your eyes. Okay, okay, go ahead. Now, the next thing that I did though is I was starting to put this together. Um, another big, uh, big wig at, at uh, National Science Teachers Association, Carrie Lunius. She's really good at figuring out how to actually, it's called the 5E method, where you're taking them from the initial uh, engagement all the way through the final, uh, final part of it where you extend. You do the innovation. People in the, the, who do the innovation, in this thing, innovation is part of the curriculum in everything, which we'll get to later on. So she, but the other thing that she did is she was the one that suggested to me using process-oriented guided inquiry learning. She suggested it and I thought, ooh, I read about it and figured it all out and, and now I use it. We brought her out to work with the teachers over on our campus. A lot of them just got, got her sidetracked on other stuff. But so, but anyway, these are her expertises and she's, she's actually, um, She's very good. Now, they're engaged, they're exploring Pogo. Let me show you what that is. That's the next thing. And this is all, all this thing through from the first three things they do in 80 minutes. That's it. Okay. And they get used to this. Pogo, I start with the beginning of the year because it's like anything else. If I'm gonna make these kids do in inquiry, which basically makes them think, if I don't do that at the beginning, all of a sudden it's like a shock and then they're gonna complain. If they come in on the, like the second or the third day, and that's the expectation, it's no problem, okay? So, you put out a little bit of information, you follow it by a little bit of data, and then you add, have them answer a few questions, and then repeat. A little bit more information, a little bit more data, have them answer some questions. They go through, each time they answer the questions, the foundation is a little bigger, it takes the next step, okay? If I take like lecture notes that I would do, that would be like one page. And put it up there, the kids would look at it, say, okay, I can plug in for those, uh, those letters, but they come away with nothing. If I have them go through all of this, okay? If I have them go through all of this, they have actually done thinking, answering questions, and they've built the foundation in their head 
and it's built in a way that, again, it's in their world with culture based in there and the vocabulary is. Okay. At the end, after they've done all of this, then I have a debrief. Okay. Now, if we're going to have a debrief, do you think the kids are going to be able to answer questions and explain things after they've gone through these three different things? Yeah. So which case, and I have them, they have to actively participate and tell me what they know. So it's kind of like I'm not lecturing at the end, they lecture to me. If there are anything, if there are things in there they don't get, then we uncover it. Or if a lot, if a lot of times, say over here, I'm, I didn't really get it, but this group over here is explaining this part of it, oh, okay, maybe now I get it. I don't let a student leave the room until they get the whole thing. Okay. Okay. Any? Um, here, okay. This is the one in your packet that you should have picked up. I actually have the full-on PEO and the full-on Pogel exercise in there. Okay. Here I only have parts of it. Okay. So Leilani heads down to the end of Chain of Craters Road, which we can't do right now, but you could do it back when we did this, and to clear ahead and prepare for her classes. This is usually Saturday morning. She likes to, she's getting herself uh, ready to study, practices a little hula. She notices that when she first got there, the water in the puddle was the same temperature as the lava that she was practicing on. But after an hour, the temperatures are different. How come? They're getting hit with the same sunlight. So there's got to be something going on. Okay? Comes, notices the next morning, they're back in their cool. So what is going on? So this whole concept of specific heat is going to be uncovered as they go through it. Okay. And so the question is, will the same amount of energy cause lava and water to have identical temperature increases? Okay. This is the picture. The, there's, these two slides should have been switched. Okay. So this guy here, these are pictures that I put on there so that they have this to be able to refer to for some of the questions. You've got some data, you've got some, some culture-based pictures there. They look at that, and then they have to analyze that. And the questions are pretty easy at the beginning. Which one, which one gets hotter faster? Okay, well, this guy over here. Uh, it asks them about the amount of heat. Uh, oh, after heating each for five minutes at 300 joules per minute to each one, it asks them to calculate the joules added in. So they're not super hard questions, but it's, it just kind of gets the mind going. And it takes it all the way on. Okay, next one. And this, these are some of the questions right after that model one. Okay, and they're, they're pretty easy to do. But let's just get the mind kind of investigating and doing inquiry. Finally, when they get to the end, this is what I have. They've gone through and they've developed that equation. Q, the heat, equals the mass being heated or cooled times specific heat, which is how many joules it takes to go up by one degree Celsius, times a change in temperature. And that's the data that they got back in the PEO. So they're plugging their data in from the previous experiment and actually calculating. So the whole goal of this is to get them to the point of where their minds on, they've come up with the relationship, they use their data to do their first calculation. Everything after that, then, and they can take this stuff and put it into their notebook as how to do specific heat problems. Okay? Now, what kind of labs can we do? Measuring heat. Love to do it with food. I do an awful lot of stuff that connects to uh, nutrition, health of the, and the human body. And so, which case, this is, we take. And I bet all of you know that calories is just the amount of heat if they took that food and they burned it. Or maybe you don't. <laughs> <laughs> calories is an English unit, joules is a metric unit, but still, it's a unit of heat. And so my kids sit there and they're just kind of like, when I get them going, we, I take them through the Sh Terry Shintani diet. They love that. And so, uh, but what happens is, we take and I have them burn different types of food and figure out how much heat is given off 
and we'll have a picture in there someplace. Oh, well, yeah, just hang on on this. Um, we capture the heat, and that amount of heat, I have it in joules, but then I convert it into calories, and then they divide by the number of grams of food that they burned. And then I can, they can compare that to the food labels or the stuff online. And so, uh, but what I have them do is, I have them use a the computer to go ahead and investigate, to come, out with, come up with some standard procedures. And then we have tool time. You can come up with all these different standard procedures, but what if you don't have the like super sophisticated equipment? So once they've come up with their different types, I give them the different tools and different things that we have available in the back. <coughs> and then they can they write their own procedure, okay? And tell them what they're gonna be doing. So I don't give them a procedure. I have them go through the process of investigating and coming up with their own. Now, the conclusion to the lab, did they achieve their objectives and how? And they also have to give the connection to the Hawaiian culture. Otherwise, big deduction. Okay, and this is kids doing it. They burn the food, okay? The heat is captured in a, in a soda can full of water. You got a thermometer that is actually measuring the, the initial temperature and the final temperature. They've measured the mass of the food they burned. They measured the, the, the mass of the water that's being heated. And so they can do all of these calculations, okay? And they do not come up with great results because so much of the heat is being lost out the sides, okay? So the next part comes innovation. You have your procedure, how can you make it better? Okay? My, uh, I had 12 groups in honors this year and I came up with 12 different innovative ways of doing it. I was really happy with that. So some of them were, wouldn't work, but at least they're thinking. Okay? So they, they do that and they have to come up with innovation. At the end of every lab, it's how can you do this better? Okay, how can you give me a design that will do it better? Okay. Okay, the other innovation, innovative part is taking it to and extending it to a culture, especially a Hawaiian culture that I haven't mentioned. So the kids, some of the kids actually really, really like that. If I haven't mentioned it, they are dogged in going to try to find other connections to Hawaiian culture. So, they're good. I don't, some of them I don't put out there because it's kind of like, let's leave a little bit of low-hanging fruit for them to go do it. So, and they get pretty pumped about that. Now, the lack of organization. <laughs> oh, man. This was me back then, although I had a really good memory. Uh, tap into Harry Potter, his book of secrets. So it's a chemistry book of secrets. What I want them to do is, each topic as we go over it, and they have to put in there, it's graded, and it's a major grade, because it's kind of really preparing them post-secondary, that you've got a class that's, that's difficult. You're not gonna just remember everything from the beginning of the uh, semester. So they have to organize that information and put it into their words, that's their world. So we have a topic, they describe the topic, draw pictures, uh, do some problems in their words, and basically, they've got a full-on explanation plus prob a couple of problems in there so that when they have to go back and study that at the end of the year for our national exam, boom, I got it. They do that periodically for semester exams, you know, summative exams. They do it enough times to the point of where it's starting to stick. Now, are they gonna remember it when they leave my class? Maybe not. They're teenagers or old people like me. But the key is, though, when they go post-secondary, they pull that out. The number of I, I can't even begin to tell you how many kids go off to college and then call home and tell, Mom, send me my book of secrets. I got chemistry this quarter. And then they use that because it's in their words. Okay? It's clearly explained in their words. When they go back, even two or three years later, it'll come back. The foundation is already there. Now, they also have to keep a chemistry book of mysteries. This I'd started partway through the year, so this will be the first full year that I've done it. If they don't get a concept, if it just baffles them, it goes in there. Now that, when I, when I bring them in for study help or they come in for study help, I tell them, you bring in your book of mysteries. After, after we work on it together, and I will never ever 
sh just show them an equation and say, plug this in. We work together where I keep asking questions. Well, it kind of, making it to the point of where it's clearer going through their mind, then they can take this, cross it out, and put it in this. By the time they get to the end, they have constructed, and they've gone through a model where they've constructed a, a study guide for them, okay? And so, and a lot of the kids do this, they do use the same method when they, uh, haven't done this, but having done this, they'll do that same method in other classes in college. Yeah, one hour. Huh? Yeah, one hour. Okay. Okay, this is my definition. World-class Hawaiian culture-based education. I have no idea. Has the organization come up with one of those yet? <laughs> Over on our campus, you get 10 people together, you get 10 different definitions. <laughs> or some that just say, I plain, plain old don't, don't know. World-class is you need to have the best methods of engagement, period, for every class. Some stuff is easier than others, but any one that is difficult, it is still doable, okay? That's why... For science, you know, it was a great thing that I tapped into Paige Keeley and Carrie Lanius. I found great stuff. And a lot of them people have stuff, but will it work for a culture-based classroom? And they have stuff that does. Okay? But it has to, this one, it has to satisfy the post-secondary success, preparation for that. We can learn all the culture in the world, but if they go off and flunk out that first year in college, we haven't really kind of met, in my, my mind, this. Now, Hawaiian culture, it, you're doing two things with this, if for some of the ways of doing it. Everything you do is going to increase your Hawaiian identity. You strengthen that, period, when you incorporate that. But it does it drive, does it drive the understanding process, okay? Is it in there to the point of where it is increasing their ability to understand what it is they're trying to learn? And that was why, where I was going wrong early on, I'd mention it later, okay? I, we'd go through, this is back in the day, I'd talk about specific heat, talk about the calculations, then afterwards and say, oh yeah, well this is why this does, you know, relative to an emu. And the kids, they were clueless when I got done, they're still clueless. But they appreciate the fact that it does relate to Hawaiian culture. So in switching it and getting it to the point of where whenever possible it's a driver, that over here, um, you're going to have, you, and sometimes you're going to have both, but whenever you have it as a driver, you're definitely going to increase their, their ability to understand it. Okay? These are my scores. Before culture-based learning, my average was a, a C minus. This is on the American Chemical Society national exam. And it was a, it's a good national exam that predicts whether or not you're going to do OK in a regular medium level of difficulty college class. Okay. When I first went to this, though, these guys were kind of like jumping around a little bit. I had better engagement, better engagement, better engagement. And, and at this point, going down through here, my students come in were a little weaker each year um, for various reasons. Okay, but when I got down here, this is with, I took a big jump when I put it all together and got so much more of my curriculum uh, converted over into this. Okay, okay. Um, these are the awards that I've won. This guy here wanted to talk about just that, just very briefly. I think that's the last slide. The, the reason why I really, I actually, I, I applied for that more than one time. And also, I was getting access to these people at really top of the game in terms of regular science type of uh, uh, assessment and, and methods. And, and so, but what I found was that if I could do that and then add the culture in, it's higher than everybody else. And that was what they said. They came out, uh, and they, a panel of three came out to visit me and visited the other two finalists. And so 
when they came into my, they went into three different classes, and the one class that they went into just really blew them away. It was a class that had four kids who'd failed biology, four kids who'd gotten Ds, six kids who'd gotten Cs, two Bs, and an A. And they were doing, they did those set of lessons, that, all of those things that you just saw. And so they got to the end of the class, and there, and Michelle, they had a rule that they weren't supposed to talk to the kids. I said, I waive that. I want you talking to them. Because um, I want you to be convinced that these kids are brilliant. So uh, they go over to, and they, they kept going around, and, and it was, they kept asking the kids. The kids just afterwards said, I had to explain it three times. <laughs> why, why didn't they come in a pack? And so, but I had two of the kids, and they asked the kids. And I told, I had prepped them, and I had told them the, the, the success rate of these kids, you know, in a little briefing early in the morning, that that was the class. And so they talked to two kids who had failed biology and explained every single thing up there to them. And it was the first that they had seen them. And that convinced them. Because uh, sometimes well, people winning these awards, they will be kids who come from like prep schools, like or the teacher comes, teaches kids like Punahou or, or some place where everybody in there is just really, and it's a teacher that may just teach like honors and AP kids. Uh, but what I told them was when I write up, did the write up and, and got moved my way along, is that all of our kids can learn. It's just how you do it. So, and I wanted them to see it, and they did. I had a really good day. So. I was real proud of the kids. Uh, the, uh, the, my honors class really blew them away out in the field. So they, they did even better than I thought. Uh, they went out while the kids were actually checking the um, potassium, nitrate, and uh, phosphate levels in the soil around the trees that they had planted. They went out with, with these monitors and everything. and so. But they went out, but I, we, I already told them, what you have to do is, I made the kids figure out how to use them. They had to read a technical manual to figure out how to use these things. And I said, I'm not going to explain it. You've got to figure it out. Which the tough part was that it, the original manual was Japanese and then, and then translated into English. And so it wasn't real easy. But they're honors kids. Of course, I'd, make, I'd make the regular kids do that too, but they need a little more hand-holding. But what happened was when they went out there, they had to go out and do their, they had to do their prep work. It's all about prep work. They had to figure out ways to remediate the soil based on <coughs> what was deficient. So they went out there, and so when they're taking their, t their measurements and then the, uh, the panel members are going up and asking, and the, the student is there, well, this is low, this is low, this is okay, so what I'm gonna have to do is do this combination of fertilizers. Uh, or if we had enough time, um, maybe in the long term, I could use these natural things, uh, like manure or whatever. But since it's so low, we have to remediate it using a commercial fertilizer. Because it's so low, we have to get the values up before the plant dies. And so they had very, very specific things. And for the kids, since different locations in the field, they had different explanations. And so, they, so it was kind of funny watching the panel members. And they're kind of nodding yes and nodding yes. And I'm thinking, they don't have no idea. <laughs> But it was good. What it really showed was, it showed the power of uh, world-class wine culture-based learning. Okay? We do a good job. It will, our education th that we're going to be putting out for the kids will be second to none. Because we'll have an added thing that a lot of schools just don't have. Okay. Any questions? Yes? Thanks so much for this. It's really it's wonderful. Um, in your intro, you gave an illustration of your own learning. Went from fifth grade, top class, sixth grade, different learning, right, bottom class. Have you done any follow up? So after students leave your curriculum, and now they go and they advance, to, or they go to another course that's not culture based, is, is there a similar action or is it? At our school, I don't know, I'm afraid to, to look. Um, there's a lot of variability at, at each of our campuses, even within the same discipline. And I think that's kind of the big thing. Um, to get to this, we have to do a lot of in-service. And you have to get the teachers to be willing to do it. And so 
What I found with people, I've, I've worked way more with people from other schools. You have to get them to have a little success and they'll gain momentum. If they understand some of the basics and they try it, they're willing to try it, and all of a sudden see their kids are really just, they're excited and they're learning, at that point, the people will continue it on. So, so but it, there is, there's a lot of variability within our campus, and if we do have a, a real, do a really good job of, of implementing, uh, you know, a program in service for each discipline, each teacher, then I think it's going to be, you'll have a continuum. So, <coughs> question. Um, well, the bottom line is there just there just isn't really a guide to doing this. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest problem with um, if I had your a teacher is really supposed to do reflection, but I just got so busy that I really didn't go back and reflect, and and then I would just just go like this, you know. I, like, why the heck didn't I think about that two years ago or three years ago? So in which case, I think now what we're going to have is, um, as it's now a focus, like 2020, and we're really moving towards this, I think that people will be able to have a model to see, because I really didn't have a model to see, other than Mrs. Krauss way back in the day. But the thing was, I didn't understand what she was doing and why she was successful until I did reflect on it. It was personal reflection that it, it, school was really, it was fun to go to school. There was other classes, I'd be absent about once a week with a lot of these other teachers because it just, I hated it. So with, uh, with more planning time, I think that my recommendation is, is that what you do is, everybody's gonna have their strengths and weaknesses. If, program is put out there where these are the component or these are the things that you could do and we get like professionals like Paige Keeley and Carrie Lonius come in and talk have them work together I didn't have any I wasn't working with anybody in my department because they really weren't they didn't get it so they're doing other culture things but they're not doing driver type things so um, but going forward though since us as an organization, we're really kind of trying to um, come up with a really good foundation that could be rolled out. I think it'll speed up. So that's just my thoughts. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Um, I'd like to say mahalo to Joel. <laughs> but the presentation was so engaging. Yeah. I think we're so blessed to have an educator with this caliber here to share this information with us. So he will be around. So if you have questions afterwards, please come up and yeah. talk one-on-one. -on -one. But I just want to say mahalo to everybody for coming. Um, this is our Kupa Akai. If you folks have um, anything in your programs or areas that you want to share with our Hawaii Hall Plaza staff, please let me know. Please reach out. Right? Mahalo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.